Hey, welcome to this week's Come Follow Me video. We are in the Book of Mormon, specifically in Ether, chapters 6 through 11. Now, again, I normally just give a little historical context and a little bit of content just to give a little background to help you with your studies, with your reading this week. You know, watch the video, you get a little overview, and then you're ready to read. This week is a little unique because the reading is the context, <laughs> meaning you want to know who, what, where, and what's going on. What's the story? Uh, that's this week's reading. Everything that you read in there is all about the reading. So we'll take a, a look at a few things, and I'll show you some charts that might help you out when you're reading. So, for example, if you go to Ether chapter 6, we know that Moroni is the one writing this, and he's giving the account. Again, he thought he was done writing, but he wants to give this account of the Jaredite people. Verse 2, here's a little content for you. It says in there that the brother of Jared uh, had carried uh, the stones up into the mount. Again, that prepositional uh, phrase is a little interesting here. He's not onto the mount or up on the mount. He's into the mount. So I don't know. Is he in a cave somewhere? Because of the same verse, it says the brother of Jared came down out of the mount. Again, maybe it's just their use of prepositions versus ours, but I always thought that was interesting. So, at verse 3, again, a little bit of content here. They're in the boat. They have these barges with these stones, and they're putting the stones in there to give light. I, I just think it's important to make a note that the Lord doesn't want us to travel in darkness. I, I think that's literal as well as symbolic. For example... In my family scripture study, uh, each morning, uh, everyone takes a turn. Uh, they each get a day of the week, and they choose a, a hymn. We just sing a quick verse to a hymn, and then we have them share what they read the night before. And my youngest read that from last week's chapter readings, right, that the, the Lord touched the stones and they lit up. And she just said, Jesus is our light. We need him to touch our lives and then we have light. We don't travel the world in darkness. And I thought, man, a little girl can come up with that. Uh, what an inspiring, inspiring words from a little girl. Again, in, in chapter uh, 6 still, verse 4, in the boats they put food. Not only for themselves, but for the flocks and for the her, uh, herds, herds uh, animal, fowl, all of those things in there. I don't picture these barges being large like Noah's Ark. And you have animals in there and all the feed for the animals. Uh, probably wasn't the most uh, pleasant smell or journey. And how long was it? Well, verse 11 teaches us it was 344 days. So we're just shy of a year that they're on these boats traveling. But again, verse 12 at the end it uses the phrase, tender mercies of the Lord. I love that phrase. That's the same phrase used in uh, 1 Nephi chapter 1, the very last verse in there. And what was this journey like? Again, the, the, the context of this journey. Well, verse 5 tells us it's a furious wind. And verse 8 tells us that the wind did never cease to blow towards the, to the promised land. But yet, what were they doing the whole time? Verse 9, they were singing praises. So here's my question. Even when the you're in the storm and the winds are blowing, have you recognized that the Lord is with you? He's guiding you to go somewhere, your promised land. And are you in the attitude of singing praises? I, there's some great lessons in there that we can have a lot of fun with. Now, once they're in the, the promised land, we see some of these people. So let's review some of these people as we as we go here. There are a lot of people listed in the book of Ether. We know that Jared and the brother of Jared, none of his sons would be the king, and they all wanted the king, and yet they talk about that, that this, this is verse 23. The brother of Jared said unto them, Surely this thing leadeth into captivity. Whenever you have a leader who's in for a long time and you can't get rid of him, that leads to captivity. So... Nobody will. It appears that it's Jared's son 
from verse 25, not the brother of Jared, but you can read that and see it differently if you'd like. And it came to pass that they chose even the firstborn of the brother of Jared, and his name was was uh, Pagag, or Pagag. And it came to pass that he refused and would not be their king, nor would any of them. <clears throat> verse 27, and it came to pass that neither would the sons of Jared, even all save it were one. So it appears that this Oriah mentioned in verse 27 is Jared's son. That's where the kings will come through, at least in much part. So, but Oriah was a good guy. I mean, he had experienced this journey. He remembers those things. So let's go to chapter 7 now and continue on. Oriah, uh, he had 31 sons and daughters. 20 and 3 of them were sons. But that's okay. So did these uh, older brothers and sisters. What were there, 22 kids? In verse, that's chapter 6, verse 20. You can see large families. It won't take long for these families and their friends to have a very large civilization when they're having a, a large number of children. Again, I'm going to let you read chapter 7 on your own, but you can see that verse 4, that Korahor rebels against his father. And so we have, and that's Arias grandson there's kid there's korahor there's there's Shul the, so you have these two kingdoms splitting up and you can see the list of children so my recommendation is screenshot this and then as you're reading this chart might help you keep track of it or just get a piece of paper and jot them down and as you're reading the story it adds depth if you understand who's related to who for example when you get down to the story Oh, uh, and then it keeps track because it was Noah that rebelled against Korahor and so forth. It, it helps with the stories. But I want you to go down to uh, where it talks about Jared, not the first Jared. We're talking down here, Jared later on, Omer's son, Jared. He wants the kingdom. And so this is the story where his daughter dances for this man named Akish. And Akish says, yeah, I want to marry you. And, and Akish goes to Jared and says, what do I need to do to uh, have your daughter's hand in marriage? Jared says, get rid of my father, the king. So Jared becomes the king. Well, it becomes worse because Akish eventually wants to become the leader too. And Akish and the daughter of Jared, it doesn't mention her name by name, they have a son that's unnamed, and then they have another son named Nimrod. Again, so as you're reading these stories, pay attention of who's related to whom. It's also worth noting here, this is all in Ether chapter 8, where uh, the daughter of Jared dances for Achish, but where they get these ideas to gain power and overthrow governments. Uh, verse 15, this is chapter 8, verse 15. And it came to pass that thus they did agree with Achish, and Achish did administer unto them the oaths which were given by them of old, who also sought power, which had been handed down even from Cain, who was a murderer from the beginning. Remember, it was Jared's daughter who was the one that came up with the idea, let's look back at these secret oaths and get ideas of how to overthrow and rule governments. And Achish takes them over. And they're being passed down amongst this secret combination. That's verse 18. And it came to pass that they formed a secret combination, even as they of old. But verse 19, here's a principle. The Lord worketh not in secret combinations. Now, I've heard people say, everything you do in the temple is secret. And the answer to that is, no, it's not. We invite everybody to enter the house of the Lord. Everybody can go. Man, woman. Gentile, anybody can go. Qualify for the blessings of the temple, and anybody's invited to go. It's not a secret combination where we're only limiting it to one or two secret people or those who have power. Everyone is invited. Now, verse 20, this is chapter 8, verse 20. I, Moroni, do not write the manner of their oaths and combinations, for it hath been made known unto me that they are had among all people, and they are had among the Lamanites. 
and they have caused the destruction of the people who I, who I am now speaking. And it talks in verse 22 that any nation that upholds secret combinations will be destroyed, including America. Now, feel free to move into chapter 9, verse 5. Uh, we see that Achish is actually going to try to take out his father-in-law, Jared, because he wants the power. And then we mentioned a little bit about their two sons. So I'm going to show you, again, the, the list goes on. Uh, so again, if, if you haven't screenshot of this one, do so. And I'm going to move to the next screen, which is just going to add to the story, because then we have Coriantumr, who's begat in Omer's old age, and Emer. Now that's chapter 9 all the way down to verse 14. And Omer begat, began to be old. Nevertheless, in his old age, he begat Emer. And he anointed Emer to be king, to reign in his stead. So we now have multi-generations fighting over the throne of who wants to have power. Again, names are on the screen. Let me take you to uh, one more screen here. So if you have on this screen, remember Heth down there on the bottom right? Then we're going to this one. Heth begins here. Now, there's a couple things you just need to note while you're reading. I put this little dash here for a reason. It says Heth. It doesn't say son of Heth is Shiz and Riplakish. It says they're descendants of. So we don't know how many generations are in between there. Same with Morianton. It's, he's a descendant of Riplakish who has multiple kids. It only mentions Kim and his brother, not by name. And then through Kim, Levi, Coram, again, a descendant is Kish, Lib, and Hertham. And then from there, again, screenshot this. You can pause and go back if you want. Then from her throne, we have another Heth, Aaron, a, and then a, oh, a favorite name to pronounce, Amnig. Oh, I say it wrong every time. Amignigda. Uh, Coriantum, Com, and so forth. So all the way down to ether. Again, just a little note here. The dash just means he's a descendant of. And over here, it, when Moron was the leader, it says a mighty man came in. And then it talks about another mighty man. Again, not by names, but these are Jaredite leaders. So as you're reading the story, again, use these names in this chart. It will help you to go through. But maybe even more important than just having the names and going through the history, which I think is fun anyway. I like history. Ask yourself a couple of questions. One, why is, are there two accounts of destroyed nations in the Book of Mormon? Is it possibly that the mouth of two or three witnesses, the word will be established, and Mormon and his son Moroni are giving the latter days a, a warning that, hey, this is what will destroy your great nation that will be established. Secret combinations. And we have two full examples of this. Uh, including examples of very righteous people who even see the Savior. As you'll read in the, the account here, one of these great men have an account where they see the Savior. So read and study and have a great time this week. Next week, we will take a look at Ether 12 through 15. We'll finish up the book of Ether. Have a great day.